Oh, what's up, guys? This is for this is going to Orange, California. Um, I don't know if Brian's on yet. Brian Cervantes. I'm actually going to wait for him to hop on first, real quick, so we can watch. Or you know what? I'll just get going on it because I'll end up posting it on the uh, highlights anyway. Oh, SX70 store. What's up, man? How you doing? This was um, a Model 1 that came in, I think about a month ago. It's actually not in too bad shape. Um, got a few things to do on it. Uh, actually, I haven't fully tested it yet before I start working on it, but it seems to be in pretty good shape. So it'll probably just be kind of a straightforward you know, adjustment, any kind of cleaning it needs. <clears throat> And just make some general checks and stuff. There were a few requests already to see one of these start off. Last time I did a live video, it was pretty much taken apart. It was kind of a custom build. Um, so this time we'll start off uh, doing some disassembly. What's up? What's up, guys? What's up, dubs? So I hope the time worked out a little bit better this time. It was a weird time last, last live video. What's up, Juan? So, a few things that I check before I start taking these apart is obviously how the motor sounds, how the shutter is doing, there's a few like pre-repair, pre-tear down things to test out here. So the motor actually doesn't sound too bad on this one, but I'll still check it out. Check the aperture at full close-up, sometimes that intercept bar sticks. Looks like it's going to be pretty good. Yeah, so I don't need to replace that. So this one's pretty straightforward. This would be cool. So I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to keep an eye on some of the questions also, answer where I can. If I miss your question, I apologize. I missed a few last time. So feel free to send an email or, or a DM or anything like that. You know, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. And also, while I'm on the topic, um, if you've sent an email over the weekend, I haven't got the emails yet today. I'm going to do that immediately after this. So. As always, thank you for your patience. All right, cool. Let's take this guy apart. Let's see what's going on here. That bar. Oh, this right here? This is uh, Instax Jax. This bar is a gear train cover, but it's also a light blocker. If you don't have this bar on your camera, light will get in in the back corner here and it'll it'll fog a little bit of the usually the top left corner of your of your print so this just is basically a snap-in piece but it's also cosmetic it, it covers a gear train that way you don't get hair gunk dirt whatever god knows what gets stuck in there some good stuff good gnarly clumps of sweater which is gross So I'm going to get rid of the motor motor coupler right off the right off the bat. Those were eventually done away with in the model. Um, no, in the flash socket. Oh, in the flash socket, it was just basically a little LED tester to test out the S2 switch, make sure that's working. But I still run live flash. What's up, Italy? Ciao. Um, but I still run flash tests. What this does is it basically initiates S2, so you can see whether or not the aperture is working properly. So all this all this used to be was an old um, traditional flash bar that I just tore down to this and just added an LED onto the first flash spot. So it's a good little tester. Okay. So I'm actually just gonna start off by taking it apart. I'll do the motor coupler last. Let's see. Got some music this time too. Much better. I like to take the shutter off just because it's easy to work on the body. I don't feel like I'm going to yank the thing apart. What's up, Chris? How's the camera working out, man?
Okay. Sweet, dude. It's good to hear. So Chris had his camera sent in for an opto sensor replacement. Some of those optos go really bad. Those are on the Sonar and the 680 models and 692. This is just kind of routine, just tearing it down. Just to make sure there's no hidden surprises. Sometimes there gets cracks under the plastic or under the plating, rather. So there's the shutter. And it's basically torn or broken down into three different segments. There's a shutter, viewfinder assembly, and then there's the body. So I'll work on the shutter a little bit later here. Let me take it apart first. Man, having trouble getting going today. Hope everybody survived the weekend. I kind of did. Hi from Oslo, what's up man? Wow, it's what time is it there? Holy crap. Well it's probably it's night time. Yeah, thanks for everybody showing up. I'm stuck in there a little bit. But for those just coming in, I'm just working on a model one for a customer here. It was a sale. It was a camera that was that came into the shop a couple months ago. Pretty nice model one. This is, uh, let's check this here. It's a 1974. CDE, May of 74. It's only nine. Truman, what's up, Truman? Sorry, I gotta remember everybody's real name compared to their Instagram handles. That's tough. Hi from Switzerland, sweet. Very cool. I'm glad I'm getting everybody in here. Seems like it's a better time to do it. Yep. Having trouble looking at the screen and working at the same time. So beauty about the Model Ones and the original plated. And tan cameras is, is actually really easy. High bar two. Com true is yes, perfect, man. This is their older one. This is uh, in decay. But the beauty about the Model 1s is getting the skins off it is super easy. Some of them get nasty, but for the most part, they just peel right off. Okay, so that's the viewfinder. That's taken apart for the most part. Here's the parabolic mirror, the rear lens. Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't too bad. Some of them, the, the clean tear off. Some of them are a lot easier than others. Uh, some of the harder ones are the poor bear. Uh, the bottom off the uh, film door is a little bit more difficult. So I use this beauty, which was donated, actually stolen in-house from my wife. Thanks, Jim. But just a little bit of heat helps loosen up some of the adhesive on the bottoms here. I don't know if I'm going to get around cleaning too much of this one right now because I just want to show the disassembly. So it's kind of a trick to take the bottom piece off. Ha, <laughs> your hair dry. Um, so there's a metal plate on the bottom here, which is called the film spring. And basically what that does is it keeps your film from flying out of the camera uh, after you take the picture. So it's really hard to get some of these off sometimes, keeping that um, close to the camera or close to the actual film door without bending it. So 
That actually worked out pretty well. Metro Photo York, what's up guys? Holy crap. This is awesome. Glad everybody stopped by. Everybody's looking lovely today. Bright and alert. I'm not going to show you what I look like. I look like... Ugh. So the rollers... Now the rollers have a preset gap from the factory. There's really nothing... To, I mean, there's some adjustments you can make, but... For the most part, these are good. Sometimes you can gap them. This is, these are really clean, too. I lucked out with this one. This is pretty... This is all cleaned up. Okay, so that's the film door. And I'm gonna pop the body open here now. Actually, before I do that, I'm gonna get rid of the motor coupler. So, the motor coupler is usually the biggest problem that people have. What would happen is, if this little piece of plastic broke in here, it would disengage the gear train from the motor. And what that does is, if you put a film pack in it, the motor would just run and run and run. It would sound like a vacuum cleaner. No film would come out of it, but it would just run continuously. Uh, later on in late 75, um, early 76 for the Alpha 1s, they got, Polaroid got rid of that motor coupler and used a different spring. It was originally just so that the gear train would clutch out if a film got, if a piece of film got jammed, it wouldn't damage the gear train at all, but some 680s are usually loose. Um, yes and no. I think a lot, Jay, a lot of the, a lot of what it depended on the, um, the emulsion spread was I think some of the formula itself. Um, lately I've been just keeping on with the, the 680 rollers. We used to swap them, but ever since the new, uh, I think it was the Beta 3 film formula came out, haven't had a problem with it at all. Um, sometimes it, it has a problem with uh, expired film. Obviously just because the opacifier hardens up a little bit, it's, because it's less vis viscous. Um, so, you know, as far as 680s go, um, with the metal rollers, I don't have any to show right now, but uh, these are the original SX-70 ones had a Teflon coated top roller. There was a different material used on later ones, but Jay, to answer your question, as to date with the new film formulas, there hasn't been a, I haven't seen a problem with it at all. Uh, with the divot, it used to be called the divot because there was like a, a little V notch taken out of the top of the film. Um, but if anybody else is having, you know, problems with it or something, definitely let me know. I'd like to hear any updates on the, the new film formula. What's up, Jason? What's up, man? How you doing? You gotta get in town, man. I don't know if it's good to chew gum and solder at the same time, but... Oh, well. I'm going to keep this, the same motor that's in here because it's actually in pretty good shape. Hi, Nick. Good to see you. Hello. So I'll show you the motor coupler here. So this little chunk of plastic was a motor coupler. And I don't know if the camera can see this or not. But I'm going to break it. I mean, it's that easy to break. The thing could break at any time, usually when you're taking pictures on a photo shoot. I mean, when else would it break, really? <laughs> so all I do is just elongate the spring. What this will do is it'll mesh up the gear train. If I put it in the right way. Alright, cool. Okay, so that's all meshed together. No more worries about the motor coupler getting screwed up. Actually, no worries about the motor coupler anymore. It's gone. Pack this back on. Storage screwdriver, the Robinson. Yep, it is. Um, 
I have to beam down to each side just enough. This one is actually a Vera. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but all I did is I used my Dremel just to whittle these down. <laughs> nice. Yeah, Tom Cruise is, or Tom Cruise is awesome. Tom Cruise, I don't know, but Tom Cruise. Um, a lot of my tools I make on my own just by um, grinding them down with a Dremel. Uh, so this wasn't, this was just all, I think this was originally a, what was this? A, who knows? Like a something. How's that for an answer? <laughs> Nothing but details here. No, that's the best way to do it is make your own tools. It's kind of kind of fun to do it. Because a lot of the old Polaroid tools aren't available anymore. And when they do pop up, they are expensive. Adhesive booger. Alright, so that's back in. Yeah, it is the zero zero, but those are still too big. You still have to you still have to grind it down a little bit. You know, depending on and then it depends on what shape that some of the screws are in. Uh, and the material of the tool also. The thing I like about model ones is everything was put together with screws too. The later models were all riveted and heat staked. All right, and then there's two contact points in the back of the bellows. There's one. Two. Okay, there's the inside of the S670. Now on this one, I did look through it for, yeah, that's one doing it. Oh yeah. Rock and roll, man. Yeah, definitely. I know a lot of people ask about them. That would definitely help a lot out. Um, so on this particular one, if you look through the viewfinder, now there's sometimes, I don't know if you could see it well enough or in, in light or if the reflection is too bad, but you get these diagonal lines. Those are usually from, those are actually from where the, uh, the bellows have pressed down on the, uh, the Fresnel ones. It's almost like pressing down on a record, like a vinyl record after a while you leave an imprint. On this one though, something happened where the sides kind of skewed and the, there's heavy shadowing on the inside of the circle. So I'm actually gonna replace this one. These are hard to get though. So I, I luckily had one from an old donor camera that showed up out of nowhere. So I'll take this off. Hinge pins that hold this in. This is just another homemade push tool. So here's the old one. This is the mirror on the bottom of the Fresnel. So this whole assembly is called the Fresnel carrier. And this is the mirror when it pops up. This is what's reflecting onto the. Uh, onto the, the film front. And on the other side is the Fresnel screen, which you're actually, when you look through the viewfinder, this is what you're seeing the image on. So here's the replacement. And they're, they're identical. The only, thing, the only thing different on this is the, the light baffle. But this one's in better shape. There's a few things I have to be aligned to here in a little bit. This is just how physically it goes together. Oh, 
Open SX70. What's up? I'm glad you can make it. Good to see you. For anybody that doesn't know, Open SX70 is an amazing resource that's going on right now. Um, Joaquin has basically developed an open source um, electronic circuit that you can do all kinds of cool manual shots, double exposure. It's really cool to check it out. Just Google Open SX70. It's it's pretty amazing what he's doing. It's a little far beyond comprehension for me. There's a lot of math involved. <laughs> math is scary. I went to art school. Matter of fact, I need to check out one of the boards as well. I gotta get it. Joaquin, I'll get a hold of you. Okay, so that's the new mirror in place. Everything looks good. Sometimes this baffle it gets caught up on the chassis, so when sometimes people press the shutter button and you don't hear the mirror flip up, it's usually because this rubber baffle, all it is is holding in place is double stick tape. Sometimes it migrates off to the side a little bit, catches the chassis. So here's the viewing mirror. Now this is something that happens a lot as this mirror starts to come undone at its adhesion points. So just squirt some silicone glue in there. Oh man, it got boogered up on me. Hold on a second. Off the mirror. Definitely makes a difference with a clean mirror. Come to Brazil, I would love to. I got some silicone on there, that's not good. Oh, come on. Oh, nice. Nice and clean. Yeah, I geek out about stuff like that. There's a few other adjustments that can be worked on here. Mostly, so there's a spring on this arm and these adjusted so it opens up a little bit easier, locks in place easier. I gotta check the uh, what kind of solvent solutions. So for the mirrors, sometimes I'll use a combination of um, hydrogen peroxide and ammonia. So I'll use that on mirrors and lenses and then on glass though, I'll just use good old Windex. Uh, there's an automotive glass cleaner that I'm trying to get my hands on, which is amazing. It's amazing stuff. Uh, but for right now, just regular glass cleaner isn't too bad. Okay, I gotta check the L6 switch. Some of these old switches get kind of gnarly. All right, that looks pretty rock and roll. I'll do the shutter next, that's the fun part. Kind of. Hi Tyler. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing, but it, I know, I kind of know. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Only if it's a beard hair. <laughs> I 
I actually shaved my shirt. My beard, my, my beard's a little bit shorter right now. Okay. That's in place. <laughs> Again, screws are beautiful. Later on, the cameras use rivets, which are kind of a pain in the butt, but it just takes a little bit longer to put them back together if you take the rivets off. So that's the body back in place, back together. You can actually, the bellies are made out of, um, you mean, if you mean the bellows, uh, yeah, <laughs> I like, I'm going to start calling them bellies though, that's a great, great name for them. Um, these are old fashioned, good old, like rubber. These are straight up rubber. Um, on some of the 690s, um, I think there was a, a softener added to it, it was almost like they felt more like vinyl. So those would rip really easily. Um, these will rip if you really try to cut them, uh, but for the most part, they're pretty resilient. I mean, they, they, it's, it's a relatively thick rubber too. Um, the worst that ever really get goes that I've seen with them is they get a little bit moldy, but that's easy to clean off the top of it. Matter of fact, I'll do that right now. But it is, uh, that is 19, <laughs> 1960s rubber, 70s rubber. It's, we can have a whole other discussion on that. But yeah, see some of that crud coming off. That's got some disco, that's got some cigarette, that's got some hotel in there. Yeah, there's the ones I like seeing are picnic spills. Those are great. Look like 25 year old beer. Yeah, look at that. Woo! Call hazmat. Uh, right now, you can use a little bit of Google, goo gun. Um, I've seen people use volano cleaner and all that. Um, this has a little bit of some petroleum distillate in it. If you use it too much. All it really will do is, oh, thank you. Um, all it'll really do if you use too much and it's, it'll just wrinkle it up, but after a while when it evaporates, since this kind of rubber is like a natural resist, uh, it does a pretty good job of just evaporating after a while. Be interesting tutorial videos. Uh, Instax Jacks, yes. Uh, matter of fact, I've been dragging my heels on it. Um, we're going to start doing some basic tutorials on YouTube. Um, just some things that you know, SX-70 users can do on their own to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. Because there's a million things that can go wrong with the cameras. Um, and some of them are attributed to just simple things like low battery voltage or, uh, you know, a film jam or just some small things that you can do at home to, uh, to get it back into working shape again. Okay, this is all done. I'm going to take this sucker apart now, too. So this is... I like these shutters. These are uh, the Texas Instrument. These are the 74 and on. Earlier shutter circuits were uh, Fairchild semiconductor shutter circuits. And like any product, they were kind of, you know, first generations. They had some bugs. They had some problems. The Polaroid even um, went in and started upgrading components and electronics. This actually looks Pretty, pretty good. I'm gonna check the. I'll check the light meter now. The light meter. Here's the photo diode. There's an IR filter that covers that photo diode on the other side. Over the years, that IR filter, the material in it, outgasses. It had a certain coating on it that basically, um, it like leaked all kinds of crazy corrosion. Uh, all right, two questions. Spot the difference. The Fairchild. Um, I'll show you a real quick. Look at it. It does have the F logo, but it also, oh, I don't have one available right now. 
And Joaquin, yes, I do actually. There's quite a few Fairchilds that come in the, in the shop. So here's a Fairchild. And yep, Truman, like you were saying, here's the one with the, the F logo on it. So this is a little bit older. It utilized a different kind of IR fil or a photo diode with an IR filter on it. The IR filter was actually built into a housing on the outside, where on here, um, on the Texas Instruments, on the inside. So you can see some of the differences with the upgraded ICs. They're a little bit bigger. But the design was relatively the same. I think, that, I think so far I've counted about 23 different model ECMs on these. But if you were to go the open SX-70 route, you would only have to deal with one. Which is a beauty. Like I said, i got to get a hold of one of those. Joaquin will talk. Okay. I'm going to check the IR filter on this one real quick. Because that can really affect ex exposure, too, if that's all outgassed. You know, a lot of people, problems people have are overexposure, even when adjusting the uh, LD wheel properly, or even to neutral. And that's usually because the filter is all gummed up. It's blocking out a lot of light. And so what that does is it'll keep the shutter open too long. Do you ever look? Polaroid Prontos. Unfortunately, no. Um, you know, there was a time where we were doing Pronto box cameras and spectros. The problem with that is the amount of repairs some of them needed exceeded the value of the camera. They took a little bit of longer time to do. Um, there are a few people out there that do it. Um, you know, I always recommend to contact Todd at Shutter Plus Light. I know he does a, a good job with some of the uh, with some of the box cams. And, and if, obviously, if there's anybody else, you know, that, that can be recommended, um, if anybody wants to step in and go ahead and give their two cents, if they've used them before, I would love to know too. That way, I can redirect to people looking to get their box cameras fixed to a good resource. So this this one actually looks like it's in pretty good shape. I don't know if it'll focus or not. But it's relatively clear. It should be nice and green. Got a weird delay on my other. Yeah, you can see it a little bit there. Alright, cool. So I don't actually this one I don't need to clean, which is great. That'll save me some time. But I will you know what? I'll do a I'll probably do a video that shows in some cases you can't just clean it, you actually have to cut it out and uh, scrape both sides of the IR filter and then uh, epoxy it back in. It takes a little bit of time, it's like maybe about a 15 minute procedure, but it's definitely worth it because then you get accurate exposure, at least from the original ECM. Okay, so that's actually pretty rock and roll. I said this last time, I don't use this often, just because it's nasty stuff. I use my, I use this sucker, which shuts off after a little bit, but I get about a half hour before it kicks back on. The dog does not like it. So actually, I'm just, since I got a little bit of time, I'm going to go ahead and take this apart and put it back together real quick and just kind of go over some of the mechanisms on it. So this on the right, this is the LD wheel. This is so there's a lot of different variables for the light path to go in once it hits the photodiode. There's the N ND filter, which a lot of people call the electric eye. Um, then there's the LD wheel. There's magnification, and then it hits the photodiode. I didn't catch the name you recommended. Oh, um, Shutter Plus Light. They're uh, I think they're in Seattle or Portland. I apologize. I'm listening to this, or at some point he sees it. I can't remember which one. But they're on Instagram. They have some pretty cool stuff, too. I'm actually using the wrong tool right now, but... So this is always fun, getting these little parts out of here. 
little spring in here called the uh, stop pin spring. If you lose that, that's kind of a not a good time. That's what that noise was, just not a good time. Yeah, anytime. And actually, like, like I said, always feel free to um, drop a DM or email. Any other questions? Email is usually the best way to get a hold of us. So I'm just going to check the. So this is what's called the cam follower assembly. This is what's responsible for the. Uh, when in flash mode, if you have a flash attached to your camera, this is the mechanism that regulates aperture, the movement of the blades back and forth. And it's a follow focus uh, design. So that means the closer you are to your subject, the smaller the aperture is going to be in relation to the flash output. So I think usually it's at, um, what is it, by 9 feet? It's like from 6 to 9 feet. Hey Camille, what's up man? Thanks for hopping in dude. Um, so this is, uh, sometimes the spring gets weak on this, and if you have your camera focused full close-up, it'll, the aperture will get stuck because this can't, this can't, uh, spring itself back into place. This one's actually in pretty good shape, though, but I'm going to clean that spring just real quick. Just in case. Much better. Nice and springy. So then, this is the S1 solenoid, that basically controls shutter blade movement back and forth. And all of this is operated by the shutter circuit. So that's pretty cool. It's a, it's a really cool basic design. Um, and it's so simple when you, you know, it, when you really can understand what it's doing, it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's pretty cool for the, the time it came out at. I don't want to geek out too much right now. So I'll just take it down to that, put it back together real quick. I still have to do adjustment for infinity. This one's actually almost done except for reskinning it. So the challenge right now is being able to find good parts. And I've said it a bunch of times before, but one of the parts that are really in demand right now are these inner lens elements. Um, mostly because how they were stored in the past, they, uh, they were either in wet basements, hot attics, and they get really moldy, they get nasty, they get totally... They trap moisture because the two inner lens elements are sealed. So any kind of moisture that gets into that will stay there for a long time and mold up. And I don't like, or I try to avoid using perfectly good cameras to take the parts off of them. When fixing, the gears, uh, depends on the gears. Uh, sometimes I do. Sometimes you'll get gear chirp. Um, I know in the originals, they get gummed up on the inside. Um, but yeah, I do use a white lithium grease on the gears in some in most cases. Um, nothing on the, actually, I do put a little bit on the inside here on the cam follower. But other than that, there's not a ton of loop spots. You know, this is primarily just to, so the focus wheel moves a little bit better. But the problem with adding on new oils or any kind of grease onto the old stuff is there's still some, this one's not too bad, but I've seen some that just have some nasty, like, caked on grease. It looks like an old frying pan. It's gross. Okay, so that's in.
the one thing that wasn't meant ever, it was really not mentioned in the um, in the SX-70 repair manual is spots for lubrication, uh, which I thought was interesting considering a lot of them actually had it. It's really apparent too on the 690s since they're relatively newer, some of that grease and oil is still fresh. I usually have a habit of dropping these springs, especially the non-magnetic ones. There we go. Yeah, it's kind of an important spring. It's the smallest spring out of the entire camera, too. That's for the stop pin. Because usually if that doesn't spring back up, your focus wheel will keep continuing to to wind and then your, your lens pops out. So that's kind of an important part. Hey Jared, what's up Jared? Hi. Come on, get on there. Okay, so I'll put this on last once I get the camera together because what I got to do is still um, focus for infinity. But that's pretty much it on the shutter. Um, I do. I actually, the solenoid, the earlier one, the earlier model ones, Joaquin, to answer your question, is they had, excuse me, that water. Um, let, me, let me take one out here. It had a circuit integrated into it, or a switch rather that was tied into the flash. So this is a later model and this is this is actually a really early model. And these are kind of the uh, these are around the standard model ones. So the two contact for Alpha 1 is enough. And I've seen some on Transition 75s, the hybrid models. This is the this is like the first generation um, S1 design. And it has, and it's harder to see on this one, it has a little switch here that was tied into the exposure and flash system as well as this one on the regular Model 1s. Um, obviously, Joaquin, to answer your question, um, they definitely differ and I think simplicity is better. This is obviously just a, it was a, you know, the less that's incorporated in the electronics design, I think the less things that can go wrong. Uh, Nonetheless, you know, still after time and age, these, these still need some attention. But there was other ways to adjust them as well, you know. Then that's why I'm saying there's a lot of shutter drag variables that you could use. You can adjust it with one of the adjustment screws, depending on the, you know, what condition the spring is, what condition the contacts. There's just so many variables after these things sitting over the years and what condition they're in and how well they're going to perform. Um, so, I, Joaquin, I'm sure you've bumped into some of that too, you know, when you're testing out certain cameras based on their condition. Um, you know, really nailing exposure to where you feel it's correct, you know, where if you put it up against other cameras and making sure, you know, the exposure is right. I have no idea what that was. That spider. All right. Um, I only have about 10 minutes left on here, so I'm just going to put it back together real quick. But that's what's included in a standard routine repair or build. Um, Luckily, this one didn't need a ton of repair. Uh, I think for some future live videos, like I said, we're going to keep doing some more of these. Uh, this will be posted to highlights here once it's finished. And hopefully it'll stay up. I haven't posted a, a live video to um, highlights just yet. Oh, screw that gets away from me. Found it. Sticking to alphas. Yeah, exactly. And... You know, as far as design goes, that's probably, well, 
I mean, you, you've seen it, that that design is basically translated all through Alpha 1, Sonar, all the variations, 680. Um, that, that includes, you know, obviously not the Sonar assembly with the flash, but all shutter components with, you know, best ones. It, it, yeah, perfect. It, it's, uh, <laughs> bye Tyler. It's nice seeing your hand, your, your handle, which means that little picture of you. Not, all right, we'll talk later. I could have said that better, but either way. Um, yeah, the, uh, the components that were used on later models, they, it was that moment, I think, where, uh, Polar was like, okay, we're good here. We'll keep it where we're at. All right. What am I doing here? I'm putting this back together. Oh, you know what? I want to put the let's put the viewfinder back together first, real quick. So one of the actually now that I look at it, so this is the wafer lens that was used on the viewfinder hood. A lot of times that if this is gunked up, this is what blocks the most light in the viewfinder path. If it's dusty or if it has mold on it. Or if anything is like just gunky or covering it, the, the optical path just gets really foggy, it gets really hazy. Also the cleanliness on the parabolic mirror too. So if those two are relatively clear, you'll be able to see your image relatively well. Jay Carlos, hello. Thanks for joining in, man. So this is a little bit longer because of all the explanation, but... Uh, I kind of like explaining it. It helps me out too. Help me help you help me. Or something like that. I would normally clean these two. Um, but again, for time's sake, I'll clean them once I get it back together. And there's some adjustments that can be made on the viewfinder as well. There's a small set screw in here. <laughs> yes, it is. There's a small set screw in here that can be adjusted. And I usually adjust that when I'm doing final tests on the camera. These go through, each camera usually goes through a 40, um, 40, 40 uh, dry cycles, and then 40 flash cycles, and then I'll run a pack of dummy film through it, and then I'll take a live shot. And that's usually when problems, if there are any additional, pop up. Pretty amazing this thing was held together just by pins and screws. Okay. So that's in good shape. The lines are good. I gotta start music over. Hold on. Man, it's already almost been an hour. Engine pins are back in. Thanks, Brian. Take it easy, man. So this is the fun part when it all just comes back together. So there's some cool stuff coming up. Um, last time I showed some of the I-type conversion work. Uh, that design is gradually getting, it's, the, it's gradually evolving and some things are being resolved. There's been some really good feedback on it already. Uh, you know, there's been some suggestion on doing, on using some new power sources, which I think is great. Uh, for the time being, I gotta kinda have to move along with uh, repair work here. So the, pro and also for those, Oh, thank you, Joaquin. It's very kind of you. Well, I've seen your work too, and seriously, it's um, it's like watching a robot being born. It's it's amazing what you're doing, and I think it's fantastic for the community. Like I like I said, I would I I would definitely like to talk offline and ask you some more questions here soon. Uh, so I hope you don't mind if I contact you at some point. But. Uh, 
you know, to your point earlier, too, and a few people have asked, every camera is different. They're like old cars. You know, they came down the same manufacturing line, but they're after they've been used for so long, they're, there's so many differences on them. Adjustment on S6 here. Beautiful. All right, cool. So usually when that, when you get to that point, everything is. Uh, that's a good sign. You're about 75% there. So the new Fresnel lens looks really good. And what I'll do is I'll end up doing an infinity adjustment on it, but let me just put the faceplate back on just so it looks like a camera when it's done here. So we'll be doing more. Um, we'll be doing some more videos and repair, customer repairs. There's still a few cameras available for live restorations on the website. Um, there's going to be a few more sales coming up. Uh, or a few more sales cameras going up for, uh, going up on the site. We had a few uh, trade-ins in that we can get into some uh, some new homes. All cameras come with a year warranty and unlimited support. Adjust the film door real quick. Tightens it up a little bit. Very nice. And there's there's a ton of adjustments that can be done on it for fit and finish. But right now, just even adjusting that arm, I mean, that's just a nice feeling feeling that snap open. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. I'm glad everybody stopped by. Like I said, we'll announce some more when we're doing these. As a matter of fact, we we're talking about just maybe doing a pop in the shop and see what's going on at the time being. Um, a few things to show real quick. Just to show this one off, kind of current, currently working on a new custom. And totally riding, riding Polaroid's coattails on this one. Coattails. Coattails. Can't talk today. An infinity adjustment is basically when you're. I know. Okay, I remember we talked about that on your Model 2. Truman, and it actually might have something to do with the wafer lens that I was shown before. Uh, Infinity is just basically setting it up so your camera, the split viewfinder window, aligns perfectly at an infinity. Um, all it, that's all that does, and it, it's just in relation to the stop focus point on the uh, on the focus wheel. Um, the actual out of focus that might have to do with some of the adjustment under the viewfinder cap. So we'll we'll uh, I'll get out and email. Actually, send me an email if you wouldn't mind. I'll we'll. Maybe test a few other things out on that. Um, but yeah, it can definitely be adjusted. So that's about it. This would all be ready for cleaning. I'll run a few dummy pieces through here. That drag, by the way, is usually sometimes from a lot of uh, opacifier in the the uh, the reservoir up on the top. Ah. Always good to test them. That very well could have been a lot of adjustments. That's actually this piece of film that's got a tripod in it. Cool. So that's basically it put together. Then it gets all pretty. And that's also when I get to uh, play with chemicals. Chemicals are for kids. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys, for stopping in. 
Um, again, we'll have another, uh, we'll do some more live repairs. We'll do some more, um, you know, next time I'll get into working on some of the ECMs with working on the meters. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to contact, contact us with any questions. Um, like I said, I'm answering emails this afternoon, so if you have an email in and I haven't responded back yet, we'll get back to you here uh, right away. Cool. Signing off, guys. Thanks very much. Have a great rest of Monday.